What's the word, y'all? All right, game number two definitely wasn't as much of a classic as game number one, but it's still a decent amount of things to talk about, man. I thought there was close to a 0% chance the Warriors were going to lose two games at the Chase Center to start off an NBA Finals, so I was pretty confident in them, and they made that a reality, man. We get to that third quarter, and everything was just so crazy. I mean, we talk about the Gold Golden State Warriors third quarter runs, third quarter avalanches have been a thing through the first two games, but the difference is, at game number one, that avalanche happened, and it was only like a 12-point game going into the fourth quarter when this one, I don't know what it was, but I felt like it was over 20 and even Ime Udoka knew he was like Tatum we gonna have you out there for the first minute or so if y'all don't get a quick run going we gonna yank you and get you ready for Wednesday because we feel beat up Robert Williams Robert Williams was our, has been injured for the last 60 NBA games for sure I don't know why every time he hoops he gets re-injured or he tweaks something else like I just want full health for him because I know how impactful he can be but we haven't been able to necessarily see that because we're, we're probably getting like 70% of himself hopefully these next two days Monday and Tuesday he gets a little bit healthier and then by Wednesday we're getting the best version of him but that avalanche was real and you know how crazy things can swing in the game of basketball right Jordan Poole in the first half I tweeted this Jordan Poole looks slow small and outmatched I tweeted that in the first half because he would get to the basket and it was blocked by uh Marcus Smart blocked by Derek White blocked by Daniel Tice. I'm like, man, this is basically similar to what we saw in the first game. It felt like the Boston Celtics defenders were just too fast or too big and too physical for him. And then we got to the third quarter, and at the end of the third quarter, he went on his own personal, what, 9-0 run, including a half-court shot. So him being slow, small, and now match didn't matter when you're pulling from the logo or shooting open threes. But that might be something that we look at throughout the entirety of this series, just like when him getting to the basket is just not as fluid as it has been throughout the regular season. Either way, that third quarter avalanche was in insane Steph Curry's hitting some big old shots he's averaging 31 points per game like five assists five rebounds if they win this series there ain't no way nobody can steal it from him this time I said if I said if it's still it's a five game series now and Boston has home court do not forget Boston has some home court they're not the greatest team at home they kept showing the stats <laughs> during this game they're like I don't know the exact stats but they showed it a couple times and it wasn't amazing their road stats are a lot better than the home stats either way I have notes, and in the first quarter, they committed seven turnovers. One of the things we talked about in our preview is that they go through these periods of time, and they go through these droughts, and if they feel like a middle school team where nobody can dribble, nobody can make a routine pass, you got that in the first quarter. Seven turnovers to open up a game. But it didn't feel that bad because they were only down by one. That's a blessing in disguise. At the end of game number one, Steph Curry, or uh, first quarter of game number one, Steph Curry had 20-plus points in the first quarter, but they were only down by four. So that was a blessing in disguise. They were still in the game, and they were still in this game in the first quarter with the seven turnovers. But then you got to the third quarter, and then none of that, <laughs> none of that really mattered. Um, I believe that the way the Golden State Warriors have defended Jason Tatum through the first two games have been amazing. Jason Tatum in this one, he had 28 points, six for 19 from the field, six for nine from three, and he, six from eight from the free throw line. He hits him extremely, and I, I know Jason Tatum is a tough shot taker and maker. He always has been. He hits him extremely tough, tough shots, shots that you can't do nothing but tip your hat to. He did not get many very open looks, right? I believe that the way the Warriors have defended him through these first two games are amazing and I don't know maybe this is kind of a controversial take and I'm not a king I'm not the king of controversial takes even though he had some really tough shots I don't think he had a really good game and I'm like which game was better between game one and game two obviously if you're looking at just counting stats 28 points are a lot better than what was it 9 11 points in game number one but in game number one he became this facilitator in game number one we got to the half court offense and he was the man controlling the O even if his shot wasn't falling and in this one all of that went away obviously you want I think you want a combination of both obviously you you want a guy that could go ahead and play make for his team but also hit the tough shots but if you had to pick one or the other I mean I'm just saying I'm just saying I would have loved to see Jason Tatum pull out more of the playmaking bag in this one because uh his team needed it I mean, both teams, it felt like we're struggling in the half court through the first the first half. Um, we were watching this game together in the party. We kept talking like, man, they, both teams need to go, go, go. Because if you let the Boston Celtics set up defensively, your odds of scoring kind of are a little bit lower. If you let the Golden State Warriors set up defensively, your odds are a little bit lower. So we wanted them to go, go, go. But I remember at the end of game number one, Draymond Green in his post-game interview was controversial, I guess. I mean, people were mad at him for saying it. But he looked at the box score. He saw with Derek White, Al Horford, and Marcus Smart shot from three, and he said, we'll be okay. He said in his podcast, we know Jason Tatum and Jalen Brown can beat us. We know those two players can beat us. We're not really convinced that the other, other people can. And in this one, Al Horford looked like he was 37 years old instead of 36. Do you get that? It's a, Chris, it's a Chris Paul reference because once Chris Paul turned 37, he sucked. 
Um, Al Horford looked like he turned 37. Marcus Smart was one for six from the field, could not get any looks, and when he did get looks, they were not good ones. And then Derek White hit a couple big shots early on, but then got cold and shot four for 13. The others, who were historically good, Al Horford's breaking records, did not come to play today. And if you're Draymond Green, it's like, this is exactly what we expected. I, I wouldn't go that far, though. I think it's somewhere in between. I don't expect Al Horford to hit six threes like he did in game number one, but I don't expect him to shoot only four shots. I think his first shot attempt came in the third quarter or something. You know, I think it's somewhere in between. Um, but the, de the defense on both ends, at least until we get to the third quarter, the defense on both ends made me extremely excited as a guy that loves good defense. I, well, until, the, like I said, until the third quarter, where we get to the point where, like, they were dropping so extremely hard on Steph Curry that I was very confused on what the hell happened from basically quarter two to quarter four in game number one and, and basically quarter one and quarter two of game number two. Third quarter came around and Daniel Tice is seven feet away from Curry. What are we doing? Why is Tice the one dropping so very far? I understand you don't necessarily want him on a switch with Steph Curry because out of all of their bigs, he's probably the, the least nimble. But still, he's Steph and Curry. And, I, I mean, they, they defended him poorly in this one. Steph Curry's average at like 31 points per game, five rebounds, five assists through the first two games. And if, I say if, they go on to win the series, you know, who's taking it away? Who's his, who is his second best player so far? That's a, actually a really good question. Who, who do I feel like was the second best? Was it Wiggins? Wiggins is probably the second best player based on the defense on Jason Tatum and all the other guys. Even though Wiggins uh, missed seven layups today, that's what it felt like. He missed seven layups today. I would say he's been the second best player so far for them in this series. Well, this guy only played in game number two. But uh, Gary Payton's second's impact was definitely there. Defense was elite. Getting out and just running is elite. The 6'3 sh shooting guard center was in full effect in this one. And um, if Iggy is good to go in game number three, don't play Iggy. Play Gary Payton a second. That should be a very easy decision for Steve Kerr. Do not play Iggy. Play Gary Payton a second because he is the the better player here because Gary, I know, I listen, I know, I know Iggy gave you a three, but Gary Payton was perfect out there today. Like, legit, he was really, really good. Loon was amazing as well. Stat line might not say it when only 12 points and seven rebounds, but he was amazing as well. The only guy that um that basically wasn't good for them tonight was Clay Thompson. And I, I was thinking in this game, bro, if if Clay Thompson cost them this game, because he was jacking up shots. And and it's got to the point now, it used to be when Klay Thompson took crazy shots like three, four years ago when they were like killing the game and running through the NBA, there was no such thing as a bad shot for Klay Thompson. It didn't matter if he looked at the rim or didn't, you know? Now I can I can say, that's a bad shot, Klay. And he had a couple really bad shots. One, he was being guarded by Peyton Pritchard on the low block and did a turnaround three-point, or not three-point, a turnaround mid-range shot and bricked it. And then on defense, on the other end, there was miscommunications, and you got a Derek White open three. Terrible, terrible, like, process right there. But luckily, it didn't cost them. Um, they were talking about on the broadcast that they kept him in this game so he can get some rhythm going. But then again, game number three is like in three nights. So it, uh, get some rhythm now. Will it carry over for a couple nights? I think that Klay Thompson, he going to be all right. But in this one, it was, yeah, was wishy-washy. Out of everybody that played 20 plus minutes, he's the only dude without a positive point differential. Because them runs was happening when he was on the bench. You know what I'm saying? But also, I mean, he played those garbage time minutes too. So whatever. Um, and I know what the big topic of conversation, I, I waited 10 minutes to talk about it. It had to do with the Draymond Green technical foul stuff. If you did not see, Draymond Green got a technical foul when him and Grant Williams got tangled up, bada boom, bada bam, whatever. It's Draymond Green, you know, he basically averages a technical foul a game. And then later into this game, him and... um. Jalen Brown got into it and in this one they went to review on whether or not it should be a double tech a single tech and they they were talking to Steve Javi I think that's who it was and they were like Steve is this a technical foul or we go, should we be expecting Draymond Green to be ejected and Steve Javi very candidly said I, I, I think it could be a technical foul but since Draymond already has one, I don't expect them to give him another one. And I know there are some there are some Celtics fans that see that moment and see the impact of Draymond Green, especially when you talk about the defensive side of the ball and be like, why does it matter if he already has one? A technical foul should be should be given out regardless of if someone already has one. You know what I'm saying? If you do something that warrants a tech, no matter what the history say, you deserve a tech. And I, I understand that for the Celtics fans. I, I honestly do. And again, I'm not I'm not an NBA officiate, officiator. Officiate? Officiate? Officiator? Referee? Um, so I don't know if he deserves. I don't know if he deserved 
the tech go foul. But I agree that if you think he deserves a tech, who gives a damn that he already got one earlier? This is a whole different circumstances. This is later in the game. So if, if they thought that Draymond Green did enough to get a tech, he should have got a tech and got his ass ejected. He needs to be better in that case because I thought the Grant Williams tech was unnecessary for him. Just trying to be extra as Draymond Green typically is. Trying to get under the skin of the other team as he usually does. And, and if he deserved the tickets in, in the first on the second one, that should be a, a lesson for the first outing. Because if you look at the first one, he could have avoided that tech 100%. They got tangled up by the boom, by the bam. They started talking, talking, talking. It was done, and then he went back in, and that's where he got the technical foul. So if he deserved tech two, he should have got tech two. I don't care if it's the finals or a preseason game. If we're going to officiate, let's officiate the way it should be officiated, and that's all. But I will double down and say the reason that the, that the Celtics lost his game is not because of that call or because the Warriors might have got a little bit more calls than you. You play like trash. I, I, I just read you the stats from the others. I read you the stats of the turnovers throughout this game. Those are the things. You dropping on Steph Curry. Those are the things that made you lose this game. Not the, the missed calls or the phantom um, Gary Payton, a second foul. That's not why you lost this game. It was the other things. But again, this is a five-game series, and we're going back to Boston. Boston has the upper hand at this point. You know what I'm saying? I don't know what Vegas says, but they have home court advantage as of right now. And if I'm a Celtics fan, I'm not looking too deep into game number two because we saw that we somewhat have a template in game number one to win another game and continue this series and win this series. You're going to have ups. You're going to have downs. But you should know that because you just went to two other seven-game series. I understand why Celtics fans are super overreact. I understand it's the NBA Finals, and there is no next part after this series. But you just got done with two game seven series. And in those series, you had big ass stinkers to get to seven. It's a fact. Oh, I just found another statistic. Um, The Celtics were nine of 25 on two pointers. You're not going to win a game like that. That's just be it. That's just honesty. And even Ime Udoka in his postgame interview said that he believed that the team was trying to draw fouls more than play basketball. Uh, Co Coach sees it right there. L yes, I agree that it's a bit uh, hypocritical of the referees for, you know, doing what they did and that officiating. But that's not the reason you lost this game. We got a long series ahead of us, and that's why I'm super excited. Um, this game was good. We just did, I basically, you basically didn't have to watch the fourth quarter. But if it ended after three... It was a really good game. It was a really, really good game. I feel like there's more stuff I should be talking about, um, but I'm not. I'm just, I, I, I'll just see you in a couple of days.